If you've been here for these evenings of grace, you know that we started out by talking about the radical nature of grace. The problem is we've become boring in the church. Uh, we've become very, very religious. Uh, we all smile the same way. We all say the same thing in the same way. We eat Christian cookies and we wear Christian underwear. And, and so the world has us figured. We don't ever shock anybody. We ought to be in the business of shocking people. And we certainly ought not be in the business of boring people. I teach uh, my student, I teach communications at a graduate theological seminary, Reform Seminary in Orlando. And I teach students how to preach. And I say that one of the main things about preaching God's word is shocking people. And I say the rubric is when you are writing something and you say, I ought not say that, that's what you ought to say. Because it's better to shock people than it is to bore people. But in the church, we become boring and we become religious. And there ought to be something about the Christian faith that absolutely takes your breath away. Where you go, oh, I didn't understand that. So we talked about that, that grace is really as radical as God says it is in his word. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've been smoking, who you've been sleeping with, what you've been drinking, what you've been smoking, what you've been thinking, the secret you have, if you're his, you're his. And when you stand before God, you stand before him perfect. And then in the second evening of grace, we talked about the radical offense of grace. When I first started doing this, I thought I'd go around and tell people God loves them and they would love me. And I like to be loved. Uh, I found out that it didn't work that way. They got mad. They got angry, and I didn't understand that. In fact, I never did understand it until fairly recently when my friend Tony Campolo says, they don't mind you telling them that God loves them. They, they just don't want them to love other people. And if you believe in radical grace, you have to be a radical sinner. And if you don't see yourself as a radical sinner then you got some problems. Well, we looked at some of the reasons that people, people get so angry at what God says. And don't get angry at me, get angry at him. We're studying the book of Galatians during these evenings of grace. And we saw the reasons why people get so angry. And then for this evening of grace, we're going to answer the question, aren't you giving people permission to sin? And then in the last evening of grace, we're going to talk about the radical fellowship of grace, the exciting fellowship. Uh, I've mentioned before, I'm a loner, uh, but because I don't have to be right anymore and because I don't have to pretend to be good anymore and I don't have an agenda and I'm not anybody's mother, I'm free to be friends. And I have friends that are so deep and so intimate and so profound because we're not playing games anymore. We're going to talk about that in the next evening of grace. But this time, we're going to talk about the sanctifying work of grace. Sanctifying is a biblical word. It means to be set apart, to be holy. It has the implication of sainthood. A saint being somebody who's sanctified, who's holy, who's set apart. And if you are a Christian, if you're a believer especially if you're a Presbyterian, you're a saint. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest you have to be a Presbyterian to go to heaven, but listen, why take a chance? <laughs> but if you're a believer, you're a saint and you're sanctified, but there's a process of sanctification, of righteousness, of goodness, of obedience, of holiness that happens because of grace. When Bill was talking to me earlier, he said, this means we got to work harder, doesn't it? No. In fact, we're going to see as we go through the material tonight that working harder is exactly the opposite of the place to which you've been going. And, and the harder you work, the harder God works at screwing up your life. And we're going to talk about that as we go along. I used to do a talk, in fact, I still do a talk show on a number of secular stations. And when a Christian calls, we always give them three free sins. And if they call on a cell phone, we give them six free sins. And that drives some people nuts, as you can imagine. And uh, one lady called and she said, I don't like that. 
And I said, all right, I'll give you four. And she said, you don't understand. I think it's blasphemy. And I don't think you ought to do that. I said, all right, I'll give you five, but I'm not going any higher than that. And she was spitting. And our producer got on the air and said, lady, get a life. Steve can't give free sins. But what I was doing is that I was talking about the radical nature of grace, that all our sins are covered. People always come to me, and sometimes, sometimes they come and they're angry. Sometimes they're really puzzled. In fact, of late, more puzzled than anything else. They say, Steve, I really, when you say God's not angry at me, that makes me feel good inside. And then I think, but I've got to be very careful. If, if, I, if I'm not careful, I'll misuse this thing and I'll get disobedient with God. And so that's the question. I mean, if I have all the free sins in the world, and I do, that's what Luther meant. He wasn't encouraging sin, but when he said, sin boldly, or he said to his colleague Melanchthon, he said to him, why don't you go out and sin so you have something to repent of? Now, Luther was not encouraging sin, but he was recognizing a reality in people's lives. And so the question is, if grace is true, if I'm loved, if it's covered, if I'm going to heaven no matter what, why bother being obedient? Why bother being better? People are always saying to me that people will use this as an excuse. Let me tell you something. I'm an old guy. I've been doing this a long time. I have never met a single Christian, not even once in my entire life, who didn't want to be better than he or she was. Everywhere, in fact, that's one of the, that's one of the reasons we're assured of our salvation. Now, there are a number of theories of assurance. Uh, there are those who say, remember the time when you received Christ or you gave your life to Christ. Write that date down, and every time old Slewfoot tells you you don't belong to Jesus because you're not a good person, then you remember that date and wave it in his face. And there's some legitimacy to that. And then there are Reformed scholars who have a doctrine called the perseverance of the saints. And that means that I know that I belong to him because I'm better than I was. And there's something to that. I mean, we ought to be getting better. Now, I don't think we're getting better as fast as a lot of people think we ought to be. But I'm better than I was. And maybe that is a place of assurance of salvation. But you know where the major place of assurance comes from? It's knowing inside that you want to be better than you are. And so the question isn't giving people an excuse. Christians really want to be better. You've heard me say it. I'm out of the box. I cuss and spit. I struggle with goodness. The only reason I do this is so that people can say, if Brown can do this, anybody can do this. I'm not a good person. But you never met a man who wants to please God more than I do. And I bet you can identify with that, too. And so the question is, how do you get there? How do you get better? Now, if you listen to people teach, they're going to tell you, work hard at it. You make commitments. You sing the hymns. You read the Bible. They say, fill your mind with God's Word, and then you won't be able to think of bad, sinful stuff. They lied. I can do that. I can multitask. I can be memorizing Scripture and sin at the same time. They, they, they're, where did they get that? I don't know. Somebody dreamed it up and said, memorize all the scripture and pray a lot. You'll be better. Well, it doesn't work. I'm here to tell you. It wasn't that they were lying. It sounded good. It sounded like a good idea at the time. But the more I worked at it, the worse I got. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it now. And then we're going to talk about it as we look at Galatians again. And by the way, Galatians is a metaphor for the entire church. What was going on in Galatians is what's happened in the church in the 21st century. It's not that we don't love God. It's that we're weird. And we want to be pure and good and sweet and kind by our own effort. And then God will love us and then God will bless us. You know where that comes from? With all of the kindness and pastoral concern I can muster, let me suggest, it comes from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. And Paul said that, and he said, anybody who tells you that stuff, they should be accursed. And so Galatians is kind of where we are. We've lost it, and we've become boring, and we're working so hard. And the greatest reason 
for our disobedience is that we're obsessed with sin. And you know we are. It's all we talk about. You can't do that. You're a Christian. After all that Jesus has done for you, we're obsessed with our purity. And that's another form of pride. And God simply won't allow it. Now, I said in another evening of grace, and I'm going to say it again, and it's going to offend you again, but I don't care. It's true. The greatest gift that God has given you right now is your sin, your inability, your failure when you know it. And the most dangerous place in your life right now is your obedience when you know it. All right, if you have a Bible, let me, let me read some scripture to you. And I've said when we began these evenings of grace that, uh, that these are not my ideas. I mean, nobody would dream this stuff up. It goes counter to everything we know. This is from God, and this is what God says. And so let me read some scripture to you from Galatians. I'm reading from Galatians, the third chapter, and I'm going to start at the 19th verse. Paul begins to answer some of the questions we're asking. Why then the law? Well, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels as an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be of the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. That's you and me, and even, Paul says in Romans, the entire world. So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who are pure. doesn't say that to those who are obedient. No, no, no. To those who work hard at it. No, 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 no. To those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian, teacher, our tutor, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by elbow grease. No, no. By faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian, the teacher, the tutor of the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons, parenthetically, daughters. You are all sons and daughters of God through faith. Now flip over to Galatians 4. Uh, we're going to read a list of bad stuff and a list of uh, good stuff when we get to Galatians 5. But let's look at 4, 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a servant or a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because your sons, parenthetically, and daughters, because your sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. That means Daddy. Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but you're a son, parenthetically, a daughter. And if a son and a daughter, then an heir through God. And then we got to do one more, Galatians 5, and then we'll get down. I'm going to start at the 16th verse. But I say, Paul says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the flesh are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Remember I said, you never met anybody who wants to please God more than I do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. See if any of these are yours. Sexual immorality, impurity 
sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things, and in the Greek you can say keep on doing such things, and are not in not any way bothered by such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with the passions and the desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Am I interested in holiness? Yeah, I really am. Should you be interested in holiness? Yeah. The Bible says be holy as God is holy. But don't, don't let it make you weird. Because if you focus on that, you miss it. Let me show you what the Apostle Paul was saying in the book of Galatians. First, he is saying that sanctification, getting better, being more obedient, being kinder and more loving, that all that sanctification begins with grace and not with obedience. Galatians 3, 3 through 6. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do it by works of the law? That's trying harder, pushing, saying, I'm going to be good if it kills me. I'm going to focus on my impurity, and I'm going to become pure. No, by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Let me tell you about a great book. It's, uh, I don't know if it's still in print. Uh, it's by Bill Hendricks, and he's of the Hendricks Dallas family. Uh, Dr. Hendricks uh, taught at Dallas Seminary, still does, for 10,000 years. But his son, Bill, is not a preacher, but he's kind of a researcher, a guy who thinks deeply about things. He wrote a book called Exit Interviews. Now, if you're familiar at all with the church growth movement, you're aware that what they do is they find out why people come to church, and they do more of it. They survey that people come to the front door, and they say, what'd you come for? And they say, well, I like the music. Man, I like it really up music. So the church growth people say, do more up music. Uh, I like the pastor. He doesn't seem so mean or condemning. So the church growth people say to the pastor, be nicer, okay? Smile more, be kinder, and more people will come to the church. Well, Bill did just the opposite. He went to the back door and found out why they were leaving. And he said, how come you left the church? Thus, the title, Exit Interviews. And if you read that book, you'll find yourself, in, or I did, inside trying to defend the church and say, you didn't understand. Let me explain it to you. But Bill, without prejudice, simply reports their words. And then in a section of the book, he gives his observations about what we're doing wrong in the church. And I'm going to give you one of those observations because I think it's profound. It's kind of long, but let me read it to you. He said, everywhere he went, people said that you had to be careful about this grace thing because people would take advantage of it. And he said the first time he heard it, that made sense. If you know that God loves you all the time, people might take advantage of it. And then he heard it again. Then he heard it again and again and again and again. And he said, there's something wrong here. And he said that uh, when he heard it so much, he realized, and this is direct from his book, modern day American Protestantism has given back a lot of theological ground that Luther Calvin and the other reformers in its heritage paid for in tears, and that Christ paid for in blood. Most churches preach grace, but they live works. Perhaps the greatest tragedy was that a system promising forgiveness to people and freedom from guilt ended up making so very many of them so very guilty. 
We need a theology of grace. Here's the situation. Never have the expectations on believers been higher than they are today. We know too much. For example, think of how much we know and understand about the Christian family, about relationships and development of children. For parents, that knowledge translates into a laundry list of shoulds and ideals at which past generations would have gasped. There's so many of them, and they're so very high. And the family's just one area of responsibility. Similar lists of what committed Christians ought to do could be generated for the believer's work, for participation in the church, involvement in the community, responsibility to the world, and it goes on and on and on. Add it all up, and it's a crushing burden that is staggering. Yet never have people been less able to live up to those expectations. The standard response to this fact is that, of course, we're weak human beings, but with Christ's strength, we can do all things. And I love this sentence. With all due respect to that point of view, let me state plainly that it's not going to happen that way. Spirituality is a process, and it includes failure and sin. However, not everyone who claims to speak for Christ speaks the language of the good news of grace. And therein lies a crisis, especially for the conservative side of the church. Based on the stories herein, I believe that the church needs to decide how long it's going to coddle legalism in its ranks. By legalism, I mean people who preach grace and practice works, people who inflict guilt on other human beings for just being human, let alone being sinful. People who say, well, we don't want to go overboard on this grace thing because people will take advantage of it. The church has made it comfortable for those who hold that position. But at what cost? It is keeping people out of the church. It is driving people away from the church. And it's poisoning the lives of the people in the church. He's right. You ought to see the letters that I get. I wrote a book a number of years ago, and the name of it was When Being Good Isn't Good Enough. And I said on my broadcast, and it was much smaller than it is now, I just said, look, if you've got a story about grace, I'm going to be talking about this in this book. And I got inundated with letters from all over the country from people who talked about the abuse they had suffered, the guilt, pastors who had left the ministry, missionaries who had left the mission field, simply because they couldn't be good enough anymore. And I'm driven by that. As you know, Martin Luther is my hero. He's been dead a long time. I always pick heroes who are dead. And all the dirt's been revealed and nothing new's going to come up. And Martin Luther's been dead a long time. Martin Luther, as you, as you may remember, there was the kidnapping that took place just before the Reformation. And actually, it wasn't a kidnapping, but Martin Luther had just been to the Diet of Worms, Worms. That's not a new low-calorie diet. Didn't eat worms. It was a place. And when he was, that's the place where he said, here I stand, I can do no other. And on his way back, he uh, disappeared, went up to Wartburg, and he stayed there and he wrote. And then he started getting reports from his church at Wittenberg. Uh, people said, uh, Martin, they're going weird. They're doing crazy things. So he came out of Wartburg, down to Wittenberg, and he's a big bear of a man, came walking down the street, uh, shaved his tonsure on his head again, climbed into the pulpit, got a howitzer, and let him have it. <laughs> and Martin Luther was a very earthy man. Toward the end of his ministry, people weren't living it. They were sinning more than they had before. They weren't as pure as they were before. And somebody said, Dr. Luther, if you had it to do over again, would you have done a lot of this, less of this gospel stuff? Would you have taught less about grace? And without even thinking, Martin Luther said, no. I would rather than know grace and not live it than to not know grace and fake it. That is so good. Because the issue is in our goodness. That's covered. That's what the cross is about. So you start with grace. I have a friend in uh, Orlando at a church where I often go, Northland Church. 
And uh, he's taught grace so heavily. And then he says really harsh things. He'd say, now we're family, you know, God loves you, so get ready. I've got to say something. That are pre- as long as they know grace, you can teach anything about the law. But if you teach the law and the people think they've got to live up to it or God will break their legs, it'll kill them. And so the sanctification takes place when you understand that grace precedes obedience. You get those backwards and you're going to come up. It's the microphone. You're going to become mean-spirited and narrow and condemning and miserable and nobody's going to want to have anything to do with you because people don't like saints who know it and look down their nose at people who aren't. Now, the second thing I want you to see is that the process of sanctification begins with grace, not obedience, but also that sanctification is defined by who you are Listen to me. I saw you drift off. It's defined by who you are, not what you do. Let me read you some scripture. Galatians 2, 19 through 21. For through the, 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 through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. Doesn't mean you crucify yourself. It's what happens when you come to him. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And then Galatians three twenty six through 27, For in Christ Jesus you are sons, parenthetically daughters, of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Not what you do, uh, who you are. I suspect that we could uh, spend a long time talking about the problem of pain. For years, I did a thing we call Skeptics Forum, and we invited atheists and agnostics and and I was the only Christian allowed to go, and I met with 15 of them per session, and I really thought they were going to eat me alive, and I found out that unbelievers don't know what you think they know. They don't know anything. The hardest thing about doing skeptics for them, and I let them set the agenda, and they would ask the questions, and I promised not to beat them over the head with the Bible. I'd simply provide honest answers to honest questions. The hardest thing was to keep from saying, I don't believe you would say something that dumb. If you had the brains of, and have you never read a book? But you didn't, because this was Jesus' thing. You would say, well, that's interesting. Let's, let's talk about it. One of the big questions we talked about, if there's a good God, how come there's so much pain in the world? I remember one psychologist who had lost his hand when he was a kid, and he stuck his stump up in the air. And he said, where the bleep was your God when this happened? And we talked about it. And there are a lot of philosophical and metaphysical and apologetic points that one makes in that kind of question. But let me tell you the real reason if you're a believer. Some of you are going through tough stuff. When my father died, I was speaking for a group of churches in the mountains of Tennessee. I don't even remember the names of the church. It's been a lot of years ago. And there was a big old pastor there. He weighed 300 pounds. And he just enfolded me in that fat when I wept. And uh, they just told me my father was dying. And he said, son, use this. Use this. Every time you talk to ten people, seven of them will have a broken heart. So when I'm talking, you're going through some tough stuff. I know that. I know the sleepless nights. I know that some of you have been told you have cancer. It scares the spit out of you. Don't pull off that religious thing and pretend, well, I love Jesus and everything's fine. you got cancer. I remember going to a hospital, and you know, if you're a pastor, people always tell you, you know, how you doing? And they say, I'm doing fine. Me and Jesus, you know, he's given me peace. And they're lying. I remember going to a hospital one time, and I said, how you doing to this lady? She said, what are you, crazy? This is a hospital. People die in this place. I'm not doing very good at all. So seven of us have a broken heart for one reason. And I'm going to tell you why, biblically, and from the book of Galatians, because God is bringing you to the end of yourself. And when you come to the end of yourself and you have nothing but Jesus, you'll run to him and that will be your definition. I don't know who said it, but it's such a great statement. 
We always say, Jesus is all I need. But you never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. And when Jesus is all you've got, then you know Jesus is all you need. You've got to define yourself in terms of him and not your goodness and not your purity. Just define yourself in terms of his love. Paul says in Galatians that you are now adopted. You're an adopted daughter, an adopted son. My friend Jack Miller, uh, who was the founder of World Harvest and the Sonship Seminars, who uh, in his death added a major attraction to heaven for me. Jack Miller, when he'd go around and see people that worked with him sad and lonely and depressed, he'd say, what are you, what are you thinking? You're not an orphan. You're his. Remember, you're acting like an orphan. That was so good. And people would all of a sudden say, yeah, that's what this thing is all about. You ought to meet my wife. You'd like her a lot. There are a lot of people who put up with me only because of Anna. And, and, she, and it's hard to live with somebody like me. I'm mercurial. I cuss and spit one minute, and I'm loving and fun the next. And the next minute, I'm melancholy, and I'm suicidal, and, you know, I just go up and down all the time. But Jesus likes me a lot, so just leave me alone. But she lives with me, and, and she likes me. And when we were in college, um, I was president of student government. And that was no big deal. There were only three students. It was a little college. Three students. One of us had to be president. And... Uh, and, uh, but I was running a lot. I was doing d dirty uh, shirts to pay for college. And I was getting three cents per shirt, and I'd carry them off to the laundry. And I was dating Anna. I just met her, and I really loved her. And the other guys had money and cars, and they would go to the theater and to dinner. And I would say to Anna, Anna, I wish I had some money, and I could take you to really nice places because we just walked around campus. You know what she said to me? She said, Steve, I don't care where we go. As long as I'm with you. <laughs> you know, she said that to me two weeks ago. You know, I'm thinking, I'm quitting a seminary. I'm, I'm going to become a Buddhist. I'm not dealing with this stuff anymore. It's just not. And, you know, Buddhism wouldn't be bad. Have you ever looked? They're not on the Atkins diet, and they smile all the time. And they don't have meetings. And I'd say, I'm leaving. I'm going to do it. And she said to me what she said to me in our entire married life. I don't care where we go. As long as I'm with you. That's what God is bringing you to. He wants you to define yourself in terms of his love. Uh, to say to him, look, I don't care where we go. I'm going to die. Then I'm going to be with you forever. As long as I'm with you, I'm not an orphan. And that's where sanctification really comes from. Then let me show you. Uh, thirdly, I don't know how many points I have, but I'm going to talk fast. I want you to note not only that sanctification not only begins with grace, as defined by who you are, sanctification is motivated by love and not by the law. Galatians 3, 24 through 26. So then, the law was our guardian, our lecturer, our teacher, our tutor, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under the guardian. Galatians 4, 6 through 7. And because you are sons, parenthetically daughters, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Daddy, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son and a daughter. And if a son and a daughter, then an heir through God. It's love, guys. It's not elbow grease. I told you about my father. Uh, my father was a drunk, and I told you about how uh, he was led to Christ by a doctor just before he died. My father loved me without condition, and even though he did bad things, it covered a multitude of sins. Uh, I, I can tell you, he was a pool shark, and I got a pool table at a church I served in Boston one time. You can, For those of you who are pastors who are listening to this, if you tell the congregation it's for the kids, you can get anything. And so I got a pool table, and I practiced, and I beat the Nazarenes. They can't play pool. And then I got so I could, I could beat Presbyterians. Don't even They can't even spell pool. And then I beat the Baptists. They're pretty good. And then my daddy came to visit, and I'd heard records about him being the best uh, pool player in western North Carolina when he was sober. 
and uh, the second best pool player in Western North Carolina when he was drunk. And so, and my mother was sure that a devil resided in a pool hall. But as soon as my father came to visit in Boston, I said, let's play pool. And my father got there and he broke the balls and ran the table three times. And I'm just, I didn't get a chance to even play. I mean, balls were going to the middle of the table and turning left and, and going into the, and, and then he, I'll never forget, he put his bifocals down on the slate leaned on his pool stick and said, son, when I was better, when I was younger, I was better. And I thought, wow, man, but he loved me. And, and I used to do bad. I, I didn't, I was not a good kid. Uh, I used to steal cherry pies. In fact, the best cherry pies I've ever eaten were the ones I stole from the supermarket when I was a paper boy getting up at 3.15 in the morning. They put them outside the doors, and you could go get those things, and they didn't know who was stealing them. They were so good. And we'd be eating those cherry pies, the other paper boys, and somebody would say, boy, if my daddy finds out about this, I'm history. He'll kill me. And you know what I would think during that time? I would think, if my father finds out about this, he'll love me. And that's a lot worse. I gave you the quote. It's such a good quote from Charles Spurgeon. When I thought that God was a monster, I kicked against the goads. But, but when I found out how much he loved me, I couldn't understand. I rebelled against him so. And so let him love you. And love, let me give you a principle because it's a good principle. Love in response to goodness is not love, it's reward. The only way you can experience God's love is to be unlovely. Now, am I saying go out and sin? No, no, no. Don't misquote me. Am I saying go out and be bad so he'll... No, but unless you are a sinner, unless you failed, unless you've blown it, you don't know love. Because love in response to goodness is not love, it's reward. And in order to be love, you've got to be unlovely. And that's, the Bible says, that's at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You can't love until you've been loved, and then you can only love to the degree to which you have been loved. Every time I've tried harder, I got worse. Every time I just sat there and let him love me, I started getting better. Uh, fourthly, Sanctification, getting better, obedience, and holiness, not only begins with grace, is defined by who you are, is motivated by love. The process of sanctification is grown by the Spirit, not by hustle. Paul says this a lot in Galatians, Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 5, 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is. I don't have time to spend a lot of time talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, but it has a lot to do with grace. I was at the Billy Graham Center at the Cove teaching that not uh, too long ago, and I was demonstrating a worldview and talking about a lady I knew who had bought into a pagan worldview. She became a prostitute. She was sleeping with anything that would sleep with her. She was on drugs. She was doing, and I was going to talk about how what you believe affects what you do. And in the middle of it, I started crying. And I thought, my, what is, I'm losing my mind. There's something wrong with me. And, uh, then I did what I tell my students to do. If you're losing it, think of somebody who ticks you off, and you'll get through it. Then you have to repent of that later, but it'll stop the tears. So I did. I thought of a couple of people who ticked me off, and I got through it. And I came down from the podium, and the guy said, Hey, Brown, I didn't know you were so sensitive. And I said, Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a lot more spiritual than you think I am. And I went to my room, shut the door, and locked it, got on my knees, and said, God, what was that? And he said, It was me. It was me. Faithfulness and purity is almost always a surprise because it's not the issue. It's the spirit 
that it's, I'm crucified with Christ, Paul said in Galatians. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's true. And if he lives in me, he can live in anybody. Then finally, I want you to know not only that sanctification, now I hope you're taking notes. This is important stuff. Sanctification begins with grace and not obedience. It's defined by who you are. It's motivated by love. It's grown by the Spirit. And sanctification is observed, this is the final point, as a dance and not as a duty. Galatians 2.21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Galatians 4, 7, you are no longer a slave, but you're a son, parenthetically a daughter. Uh, and if a son and a daughter, then an heir. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 2. Of all of creation, an heir through God. Galatians 4, 27, for it is written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud. You are not, uh, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Do you know what a legalist is? It's somebody who, when they dance, look like they're marching. You know, supposed to dance, the song says, as if nobody was watching. Uh, I, we one time did a radio rally in Cincinnati, and it was a charismatic church. Now, I'm not charismatic, but some charismatics prayed for my daughter, and she got well. So I don't make fun of charismatics or Pentecostals and thunderstorms, okay? So they had a large auditorium, so we did it. And, and in their certain, now I'm a Presbyterian. We don't do this. I mean, our hands don't go up above our belt. There's something, we just don't do that. But I'm in this church, and they're dancing in the aisles before I'm teaching. And this was on a Sunday morning. We'd done the rally the night before. And, and they had banners, and they're waving banners and dancing. And I decided that I was going to dance. Uh, and so, uh, and I can still see my staff in the back of this auditorium laughing at me because I just couldn't pull it off. I was trying to do it, to get into it. But you know, God said, you don't do it well. But I'm so fond of you that you would want to do that. And I have Presbyterian friends be mad at me. Listen, that's what this is about. It's saying, what the hey? I'm free. Do you know who Cynthia Clawson is? She's a wonderful Southern Baptist singer. And, she, and I often do things with Bill and Gloria Gaither, and, I, and she does too, and so I love to watch her. When she sings, and it's mostly a cappella, she does this thing with her hands. And she'll sing, amazing grace, how sweet. The... And one time she stopped and she said, you ever wonder why I do all this stuff? And I'm thinking, yeah, I wondered about that stuff. It's kind of weird. She said, I was raised a Southern Baptist. My daddy was a preacher and he wouldn't let me dance. And it had to come out somewhere. <laughs> and so it comes, it does. It does. Do you know the clearest sign of whether Jesus is in the building? Purity, no, you can fake that. Doctrine, no, you can fake that. If you memorize it, you can con the whole world. What is the clearest sign of Jesus being in a building? It's the laughter of God's people. Because we're the only people on the face of the earth that have anything to laugh for. Have you ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Pilgrim's Progress, you'll remember, Mercy has, was laughing in her sleep. And Christiana says, I heard you laugh in your sleep last night. Mercy's. She, and Mercy said, I dreamt. And she said, I dreamed that I was dressed in filthy rags and I was dirty. And then I looked down and I was dressed in wonderful clothing and jewels and gold and diamonds. And then I heard a voice from the throne. And the voice said, welcome, daughter, welcome. And I did laugh and laugh and laugh. So if you listen to what I taught you during this evening of grace. Chill out. Quit being so religious. Go offend somebody. Dance. Be loose. Because he loves you more than you could possibly know. And tomorrow morning you'll wake up and you'll be better than you were today. You think about that. Amen.